<laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I have OCD, so I've got to fix it. <laughs> I also serve here as your lead pastor. I think it's lined up. <laughs> you have no idea. Some of you do. It's kind of funny. <laughs> I'm excited to be continuing in our Jesus League series. We're in the sixth part where we're looking at the authors of the New Testament portion of our Bibles, who they were and what they wrote. But before we begin this morning, I want to share a win with you. Can I do that? Yeah? All right. We're going to share a win. At staff meetings here, we go over our wins, not just the prayer, which is very important, <laughs> not just the business of the church, which is kind of important, but our wins, where we see God at work in our midst. And I want to share that win, this week's win with all of you. So a lot of you know that we film our sermons really with a two-fold purpose, kind of a virtual lobby, so to speak, so people can see what we're all about before they come in. I was talking to someone this morning. They said, oh, I saw you online. I said, you still came? Unbelievable. <laughs> Very brave. So anyway, <laughs> real church, real people. Also, it is for the people that can't be here with us. Some people go up north for the summertime and they can stay engaged. Also, there is a growing number of people who are a part of C3 Church who have never been to Naples before. They're watching online through social media. They kind of get hooked up with it. They get the app and they kind of interact with us. And so I want to share with you one such interaction. It was with a woman maybe about six months to a year ago. She was watching online and she had some questions. And through this interaction, she told me her brother was in prison. So we prayed for him and she's sharing Jesus with him. About a week ago, she shared one of our sermons on one of her pages. It's a larger group that she shares with, which is really cool. But in the message that accompanied it, she said her brother in prison has a need. He needs Bibles. Not only is he engaging in the Word, he started a Bible study while in jail that already has over 30 people in it. So the church office, I think they sent out 40 Bibles to them and 40 Mark for Millennials books so they could use it as a guided study if they need to. But I want to invite you into this opportunity. Maybe you will feel led to send something to John as well. Maybe a Bible. If you can't afford that, that's fine. Maybe a letter. Hopefully you have better handwriting than I do. <laughs> but encourage our brother in the faith. I want to invite you in, into this. Uh, it's going to click off the screen real fast, but it's in the app. So if you look at the sermon notes part of the app today, you can pick up the address, pray about it if you feel led. So Galatians 6.10, <clears throat> opportunities. So then, let's work for the good of all whenever we have an opportunity, and especially for those in the household of faith. Remember Romans 3.23, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But through Jesus, we are washed, no matter what we have done. So these people, having accepted Jesus, are holy, righteous, and redeemed. They're paying what they owe to society, but ultimately their debt is canceled through Jesus Christ. Amen? It's an important message that I've been um, sharing with you guys every week almost. We've all sinned, all right? It's time to remove that guilt, that shame, that regret, and move on in Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul said of himself, 1 Timothy 1.15, this saying is reliable and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the biggest sinner of all. We need to keep that in mind when we're interacting with people. So I want to thank the media team for what they do. It is critically important to going beyond these walls and reaching people. We're reaching a lot of people with these messages. The Jesus League. So I want to recap just a little bit. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is where we started the four gospel accounts, the biographies about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We did those the first four weeks. When we covered Luke, we saw that he also wrote Acts, which is a history of the early church. 
Then we covered Paul, right, which was difficult, hard to find a theme because there's 13 books. We tried. <laughs> Paul's difficult to cover. But now we're going to reach Timothy. Now, if you know your Bible, you're probably like, hold on a minute, Gene. Timothy didn't write any of the books of the New Testament. Kind of, sort of. Timothy is who Paul is writing to in two of those 13 letters, First and Second Timothy. Timothy, if you know your Bible really, really well, is listed as a co-author, which we'll look at later as some of Paul's letters. He first appears in Acts 16, so let's look at that really quickly. Acts 16, 1. Then Paul reached Derbe and then Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy. He was the son of a believing Jewish woman and a Greek father. The brothers and sisters in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take Timothy with him, so he circumcised him. This was because of the Jews who lived in those areas, for they all knew Timothy's father was Greek. So why have him circumcised? Well, if they know his father's Greek, they might not listen to him, the Jewish people there. But if he gets circumcised like a Jew would be, then they might listen to him, and then the gospel might follow. Look what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 19. Although I am free from all people, I make myself a slave to all people to recruit more of them. I act like a Jew to the Jews, so I can recruit more Jews. I act like I'm under the law to those under the law, so I can recruit those who are under the law, though I myself am not under the law. I act like I'm outside the law to those who are outside the law, so I can recruit those outside the law, though I'm not outside the law of God, but rather under the law of Christ. I act weak to the weak, so I can recruit the weak. I have become all things to all people, so I could save some by all means possible. All the things I do are for the sake of the gospel, so I can be a partner with it. Very important. Timothy is one of Paul's most trusted disciples. We'll talk about that in a minute. But look what he says about him in Philippians. Philippians 2.19. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to see you soon, so that I may be encouraged by hearing about you. I have no one like him. He is a person who genuinely cares about your well-being. All the others put their own business ahead of Jesus Christ's business. You know his character, how he labors with me for the gospel like a son works with his father. Remember that as well. Timothy was an elder under Paul's oversight. We'll talk about elder pastor today if you want to stay after service during growth track. It's where you learn a little bit about the church. I'll talk about leadership. We're going to kind of use a couple things this morning almost interchangeably just for the sake of argument and that will be elder, pastor, there'll be he and she, those pronouns. All right, so I'll just use them interchangeably. We're not going to worry about that. So don't be confused. There's nothing more to what I'm saying than that. He got his position <clears throat> through something called discipleship. What is discipleship? Discipleship is about a mentor doing more than just teaching, but replicating himself or herself in that person, taking them under their wing like a parent would to a child. It goes beyond the classroom and allows for a complete view of that person's life for the purpose of training up a good godly leader in the church. So there's importance here of education plus discipleship. Very important. There are two different things. I love education. Those of you who know me know that I'm always listening to lectures, studying and furthering my education. But that is no replacement for biblical discipleship. Here at C3, we believe that that process takes at least three years. Again, education is important. I've discussed how I'm a bookaholic. <laughs> I've got a meeting with someone from a Christian book, actually, this week. That should be interesting for them. <clears throat> but there is no replacement <laughs> for the hands-on apprenticeship training that comes through discipleship. Even in the secular world, this type of training is observed. My wife was a school teacher years ago. I was going to say many years, and then she'd kick me. But years ago, she's a school teacher for almost 10 years, and she will tell you that she learned more by student teaching in the classroom than anything she learned in all her years in college. 
in pastoral ministry. You are faced with some impossible situations, some of which include death. So you must be well-trained and, importantly, tested so that you can handle the pressure of accepting a situation that you cannot control, where you will not win. Some people may even hate you. You are not going to make everyone happy. Oh, and good luck, by the way. Preach a good message on Sunday morning because that's the only day most people think you work. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to hope that we don't have any Trekkies here because I'm going to totally butcher a Star Trek story. <laughs> and I'm going to tell it, but not the part you want to hear. So in Star Trek, they have this simulation called the Kobayashi Maru. Who remembers that? Oh my gosh, I feel like such a nerd right now. All right, so I'm not a Trekkie, so that's why I'm going to butcher. Anyway, so I've got to really explain this thing. It's this simulation. It goes all the way back to Wrath of Khan, and then it was kind of redone in the new movies. All right, Dane's not here, so this was for Dane, and I'm just, just going to crash and burn. <laughs> it's a simulation they put these Starfleet cadets, or whatever they're called, through. It's fake, you know, so it's a, they, they put them in a mock bridge. You remember the bridge with Captain Kirk, and he'd sit in the chair and tell everyone, what? come on, guys. <laughs> okay. Alicia's like, yes, I do. <laughs> and you weren't even born in America, were you? This is sad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See? All right, we'll be nerds together. So they put him on a bridge, and they put him in an impossible scenario. It's a lose-lose situation. All right? They have to go get this stranded ship and save these people on the Kobayashi Maru. It's like a Japanese word. Never mind, I won't get into that. But they've got to save these people. But in order to do it, you have to enter enemy airspace. And there's these Klingons that are definitely going to shoot down the USS Enterprise. Come on, you've got to know the name of the ship. <clears throat> so they're going to shoot you down. You're going to get blown up. You can't win it. Or you leave the people there and let the Klingons kill them. It's lose-lose. Why would you do that? Because you can tell the character of a person when they are faced with imminent death. There's no other option. That's it. Your character shines through. That's what it is to be tested. Now, Captain Kirk, he cheats, spoiler alert for you guys, and that's what everybody likes, but that's not really one of his best traits, so we're not going to go there. Biblical discipleship <laughs> training should be like Navy SEAL training for the mind and soul. It's better to fail during the test, find out maybe that you don't want to do it, than it is to fail a church. 1 Timothy 3.10 they, the deacons, elders, or pastors, should also be tested and then serve if they are without fault. It's about good, godly discipleship through the leading of godly people. This is why our overseer, Pastor Wayne, has trained me in that way and is there for me like Paul was for Timothy. Paul left Timothy in Ephesus to watch over the flock. This is what an overseer or church planter does, <clears throat> like Pastor Wayne did with me. As we continue, we're going to see an emphasis on teaching right at the end. That's where we're going to bridge. 1 Timothy 1.3. So this is what Paul writes to Timothy. When I left for Macedonia, sorry, we talked about words before, I asked you to stay behind in Ephesus so that you could instruct certain individuals not to spread wrong teaching. There's another key verse in discipleship. 2 Timothy 2.1. So, my child... He writes to Timothy, draw your strength from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Take the things you heard me say in front of many other witnesses and pass them on to faithful people who are also capable of teaching others. So there is what we call a chain of discipleship. This is very good and biblical. Everyone needs a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. What does that mean? Everyone needs someone that they're learning from. Someone that they're doing life with that you can relate to. And someone, even if it's just a little bit further behind you, even a week, a month, whatever, that you're discipling, you're bringing up. This should be happening in every Christian's life, but at a much deeper and more intentional level for those who want to train to be pastors. 
True disciples make disciples. This is a part of that biblical discipleship chain. It's about relationship, mentoring, and teaching. A disciple becomes like a son to his mentor. He comes under that person's teaching. Does anyone remember what Paul's teacher's name was? Can you say it? Paul said, <laughs> try it. Gamaliel. You can go with that. Right? So he came under his teaching. It's the proper posture of a disciple. Disciples do life with their mentors. The disciples of Jesus followed him for three years. They did life with him. They lived with him. It's different than schooling. It's a much more relational process. You have to vet these people. You have to get to know them, get underneath everything, what they're going through. You see, we're dealing with all these difficult things, but then our own stuff too. Believe it or not, I'm a human being. <laughs> all right? So I'm dealing with my stuff, and I have to navigate that as I help others. So it's more like a father figure, per se, than just a teacher. Again, a pastor must be equipped to deal with some really difficult things that a lot of people don't like to deal with. The pressure of criticism. It's not fun. Setting boundaries. Learning how to lose graciously. Tragedy. Death. Rightly handling and teaching God's word. How to deal with family life and balancing that with ministry difficult. Godly living behind closed doors. And importantly, understanding that you are not God. If you don't understand that, and that goes for everybody, you're going to burn yourself out. There is much work we must let him do. Discipleship. It's called for in every church. But in order to make disciples, you must be an equipped and faithful disciple of Jesus. So there are serious qualifications. 1 Timothy 3.1, this saying is reliable. If anyone has a goal to be a supervisor or overseer, elder, pastor in the church, they want a good thing. So the church's supervisor must be without fault. They should be faithful to their spouse, sober, modest, and honest. They should show hospitality and be skilled at teaching. There's that teaching again. He tells Timothy, actually, to be constantly nourished. Beautiful Greek word in there. Constantly nourished in the scriptures. Then he goes on to say this, 1 Timothy 4.13. Until I arrive, pay attention to public reading, preaching, and teaching. Don't neglect the spiritual gift in you that was given through prophecy when the elders laid hands on you. Practice these things and live by them so that your progress will be visible to all. Focus on working on your own development and what you teach. If you do this, you will save yourself and those who hear you. If you do this, you will save yourself and those who hear you. No pressure. So we see the seriousness that revolves around being a pastor. He's responsible for the spiritual well-being of the church. So this is why a thorough discipleship process, in addition to education, is critical for anyone who seeks that office because he is a guide and example to the church and the people he is discipling. So we're looking at letters here, right? Going back and forth to different people in the church. So like they had letters in the early church, we have communication too, email. We also have video. So on that note, special treat. Let's hear a word from our overseer, Pastor Wayne. Good morning and welcome back to the Jesus League. We read the stories, we hear their names, but who were these men and women recorded in the Bible? Today, we take a brief look at Timothy. Timothy was from Lystra in Asia Minor, born of a Greek father and a Jewish mother who had come to faith. The Apostle Paul met Timothy when Paul and Barnabas first visited Lystra on a mission trip. You can read all about that trip of Paul's visit to Lystra in the book of Acts. It was there that Paul healed a man crippled from birth, which in turn led many of the inhabitants of Lystra to accept Paul's teaching and 
More importantly, to accept Jesus Christ as Lord. When Paul returned a few years later, Timothy was already a respected member of the congregation, as were his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. Check out the high esteem Paul held for these three people. We read about it in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy, clearly recalling your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois, then in your mother Eunice, and that I am convinced is also in you. Paul's letters to Timothy, known to us as 1st and 2nd Timothy, are really pastoral letters dealing with a great many topics, but topics like these, false teaching that was leading to confusion and a bad witness for the church at large, lack of true individual transformation, encouragement to Timothy so that he might embrace his call as a leader and a a church planter, accepting the required risk and sacrifice that comes with that call. But what else do we know about Timothy, the man? Well, we know Timothy was young. We also know Paul didn't see his age as an impediment to ministry. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul writes, Let no one despise your youth. Instead, you should be an example to the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. While some things, Paul writes to Timothy, might not specifically apply to us, this certainly does. Like Timothy, we should also realize that we live on this earth as an example. How we speak, what we do, how we demonstrate love toward others. All this and more is being watched and watched carefully. It's sobering at times to realize that we are the only Bible that some people will ever read. Back to Timothy. There is a suggestion that Timothy was by nature reserved and even timid. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 10. If Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear from you, because he is doing the Lord's work, just as I am. Perhaps this is why Paul affirms in 2 Timothy chapter 1, God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, love and sound judgment. But make no mistake, Timothy was willing to sacrifice for the faith. We read in Acts chapter 16 and verse 3, Paul wanted Timothy to go with him. So he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that Timothy's father was a Greek. Now, this is what I call true personal sacrifice. A fully grown man willingly submitting to circumcision. Why? Well, for the hope of sharing the gospel with others. You heard me right. For the hope of sharing the gospel with others. Wow. I wonder, if it would give you the hope of sharing the faith, the gospel with others, people that are different than you, would you be willing to cut your hair? Willing to wear shorts? Sing hymns? Would you be willing to get a tattoo? Would you be willing to wear a tie or take a tie off? Mind you, we don't have to sacrifice. But then again, neither did Timothy. Timothy chose to sacrifice. 
prompted by his love for others. Someone famous has said, the entirety of the faith can be boiled down to this, our passion for Jesus and our compassion for those for whom he died. I don't know about you, but that gives me pause. St. Augustine would later commend Timothy's zeal in forsaking his country, his house, and his parents, literally shedding blood, sweat, and tears, all to follow Paul and share in Paul's poverty and the sufferings for Jesus. His relationship with Paul was close. And Paul entrusted him with missions of great importance. Timothy's name appears as the co-author of 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Philemon. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi about Timothy, saying, quote, I have no one like him. When Paul was in prison, awaiting martyrdom, who did he summon for comfort? You guessed it, Timothy, his faithful friend. History records that in the year 97, the 80-year-old now Bishop Timothy tried to halt a procession in honor of the goddess Diana, and he did it by preaching the gospel, standing in their way, preaching the gospel. The angry mob beat Timothy, dragged him through the streets, and ultimately stoned him to death. Like his mentor, Paul, once Timothy had found faith in Jesus, he set out on a course to pour himself out as a drink offering. In my mind's eye, I can see Timothy there on that busy street, marked by shouting and dancing. I can see Timothy interrupting the procession and denouncing the idolatry, openly professing Jesus and emulating Paul as he owns Paul's words written to Timothy decades before. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, we may never be called upon to interrupt a procession honoring the goddess Diana or any other such procession. But wouldn't we each like to be found faithful in the end and be able to stand before Jesus unashamedly saying, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. When I was 10 years old, grandfather told me to live as if I only had two weeks left. He wasn't a Christian. But it certainly was an encouragement, an encouragement to choose my priorities carefully. If you're not there yet, but you want to stand before Jesus and say that you've fought a good fight, finished the race, and kept the faith, I wonder, what would you have to change? What new choices would you have to make if you only had two weeks left. How about you and I begin this new week selecting just one thing we can change so that we can walk more closely with Jesus. I have mine. What's yours? You ponder that.